the virus is very weak. It actually can't get into your systems just by touching it. What happens is you take your hands and then you touch your eyes, your nose, or your mouth. There's an incredible amount of information coming out at an incredible pace right now, and you need to be reading from credible sources. Getting all your vaccines up to date, including particularly the Pneumovax and the Prevnar, really, really important to do. Certainly, we have to have a heightened level of caution around older adults, but not all older adults are created the same. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Marissa Lennox. Welcome to a special episode of The Zoomer. My name is Marissa Lennox, Chief Policy Officer at CARP and host of The Zoomer. And I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Nathan Stahl, a physician practicing geriatrics and internal medicine in Toronto, and Dr. Sohail Gandhi, President of the Ontario Medical Association. We chose this format, an interactive town hall, to ensure that Zoomers who have concerns about coronavirus can get access to the information that they need to protect themselves and their families. We're in unprecedented times. Borders are closing around the world. People are being asked to self-isolate. There are a lot of questions and our intention is to get to as many of your questions as possible today. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. As the coronavirus spreads in Canada and around the world, older adults and those with compromised immune systems have emerged as the most vulnerable. In order to mitigate the impact of COVID-19, everyone has a role to play. Now, and always during cold and flu season, stay home if you are sick. Change how you greet one another. Since respiratory viruses are spread through contact, Practice frequent hand hygiene and coughing and sneezing etiquette. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces, such as door handles. These are some of the most important ways that you can protect yourself and your family from respiratory illnesses, including COVID-19. Okay, let's go to the lines now. Our first question is from Wayne. Wayne, you're live on the air. What's your question? My question is this. Uh, they talk about cleaning things and washing your hands. The reality is how I'd like to know how long a virus lives on surfaces. Uh, do I uh, have to get my coat washed every time I come in the house after going grocery shopping? How about smooth, smooth surfaces? Can I leave something in the garage for two hours or one day, and will it be then clean of the virus? Yes, yeah, so it's, a, it's a very good question. So uh, we're learning about the coronavirus on an hour-to-hour -hour basis. Uh, you've highlighted a couple issues here. One is what public health authorities are telling us are to clean the surfaces that are frequently touched. Uh, so these are door handles, common thoroughfare areas. And it's not just surfaces that you've touched, but it's that others are touching and then interacting with you. Because as you've highlighted, the virus is what's called, it's spread through what's called droplet contact precaution. So some of the respiratory droplets can last on surfaces. Now, from what we know and from uh, other respiratory viruses, most of those surfaces tend to be hard surfaces. You've highlighted the issue of soft surfaces, which we have less data on. Uh, but I would say at this point, um, we have to exercise as much caution as possible. Don't go overboard, but again, clean the surfaces that are frequently used, the ones that come into contact with other individuals. If, it's, if, it's, uh, if you're the only one there and you've left an item in your garage and you touched it two hours ago and no one else has come into contact with that, that's not so much an item that you need to be cleaning again. Yeah, and just to highlight, the way the virus is transmitted is when you cough or you sneeze, droplets come out of your mouth or your nose, they can go up to two meters and land on a hard surface, and that's where the virus sits. What happens then is someone comes along, touches it with their hands. Now, the virus is very weak. It actually can't get into your systems just by touching it. What happens is you take your hands and then you touch your eyes, your nose, or your mouth. And those are the entry points into your system. And that's why the advice is given that you need to wash your hands properly for 20 seconds. And it has to be good 20 seconds. And if you don't have Purell, don't panic. Just use regular soap. Just make sure it's good 20 seconds. And that's why the advice is being given to clean surfaces that are touched by many people regularly because you disinfect the virus from there. Thank you, Wayne. Let's go to the next caller now. Stan, Stan, you're live on the air. What's your question? My question is that uh, I'm 67 years old, and uh, I'm in good health. Uh, my son lives with me, and he works in a bank as a teller. So he's meeting face-to-face -face with people all day. 
and I'm wondering if it is uh, if it's not prudent for him to continue working at the bank because he might pick up uh, this this, this uh, virus and pass it on to me. Yeah, so these are really good questions, and, and unfortunately, we don't have black and white answers for all of these situations. Uh, what we do know, so you've highlighted a few things here, one being that you're an older adult. So there's been a lot of talk, and there is data, mostly coming out of China, but now we're getting emerging data from other parts of the world, that the mortality rates related to the, the people who are dying related to the virus tend to be older adults, uh, and especially those over the age of 80. Though the data, so about 15% of all those in China who are affected over 80 uh, who got the virus died as a result of it, and those 70 plus, it was in the range of about 10%. So certainly we have to have a heightened level of caution around older adults, but not all older adults are created the same. So age is but one factor, but when you age, you also tend to accumulate what are called comorbidities or other diseases. And those are the things that also place you at risk of dying from the disease. So it's not that all older adults have to panic simply because of their numerical age. They need to exercise a, a greater degree of caution. You raised the point about co-living with someone who's out in the community and is interacting with lots of individuals on a face-to-face -face basis like a bank teller. But the, the major thing that uh, we have to rely on as a society is that people are going to not come into the public and not come to work when they are sick because that's going to transmit the virus. We are starting to see reports about asymptomatic transmission as well, and that raises larger concerns uh, related to the situation that you've talked about. So I would say if you're living in a house with an individual who is interacting with lots of individuals like this, it's practicing the things that Dr. Gandhi talked about. Sanitizing the surfaces that are commonly used, maintaining good hand hygiene, practicing what's called respiratory etiquette, so not sneezing into your hands and touching your face, but rather your elbow, and again, keeping away from individuals when you're sick. All right, we need to take a short break. More of your questions on the other side. You have to look down to the states, right? We're seeing transmission of this virus in Florida, and they have temperatures that are approaching 30 degrees Celsius. Welcome back to our special CARP and Zoomer Media Coronavirus Information Town Hall. The lines are full as we continue to take your calls and questions on COVID-19. Now we're going to Stephen next. Stephen, you're live on the air. What is your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, my question was regarding my wife and I are 68 and 69 respectively. We're wondering about uh, being like in the store to pick up items. Is the virus on those items that possibly could uh, you know, we could uh, bring it back home. Um, the question uh, also includes the um, the issue of, you know, this asymptomatic transmission when we're out and about. So should we be, you know, like using uh, 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 sanitizer after touching these items or wait till we get home? Yeah, so again, a really great question. What I can tell you today is that I'm seeing throughout the province lots of people take extra precautions and what I'm telling you today is that it is right now it is safe for you to go out for those essential things but I would not encourage you to go into say a, a casino as you know the casinos are all being shut down because those are close crowded environments where there's lots of people who are together and I would not encourage you to go to any environments like that whether it's bars restaurants or or, or casinos. Uh, going grocery shopping, I think, well, you have to go grocery shopping. I think right now it's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, I think that practicing good hand hygiene, as I mentioned earlier, that's essential. You probably don't have to do it right away, but certainly when you get home, wash your hands after you've put the groceries, and especially if you've got some hard surfaces, you've got boxes or, or things like that, uh, you can certainly wash your hands for 20 seconds with regular soap. That should be good. And avoid touching your face, right? Because if it's on your hands and you've forgotten to wash and you've rubbed it in your face, that's how you're getting infected. It's not so much the breathing in of the air around others. All right, next on the line, we have Peter. Peter, you're live on the air. What is your question? I have a, a two-part question. I was told that drinking warm water is effective for most viruses, and you should also gargle as a prevention with a simple solution of salt and warm water. Make sense? 
Uh, not really, uh, to be honest. I mean, there'd be no good evidence to support that practice in the face of other viral infections. I think, you know, in this time, the, the, in a, outside of the precautions we've talked about, you should, be maintain, you should be living your life the way you would normally live your life. So keep staying hydrated, eat the way you'd try to eat, try and exercise, do the things you're normally being, being told to do. But other than advice coming from your public health authorities, there'd be no evidence to support that practice in terms of preventing transmission or infection with COVID-19. Maybe one just additional question. Can the virus survive in warm climates? Too early to tell. Yeah, it's, it's, this is something that people are talking about, but you have to look down to the states, right? We're seeing transmission of this virus in Florida, and they have temperatures that are approaching 30 degrees Celsius. We also have seen in other pandemics like uh, the uh, MERS or uh, H1N1. Sorry, MERS was not a global pandemic, but the H1N1 was a global pandemic. Warm climate didn't seem to have an effect on the transmission of the virus, so I would not hang your hat on the sort of warmer temperatures abating this pandemic. All right, next on the line, we have Valerie. Valerie, you're live on the air. What's your question? Yes, good morning. I'm calling from Alberta. I'm a 71-year-old, I guess, senior. I have a question regarding a non-essential imaging appointment that I have this afternoon for a mammogram bone density. Uh, I am required to go into a medical building that has laboratories, mediclinics, uh, imaging, and I'm, I'm just wondering at this point, I can't get through to their lines to ask the question live to them. I wonder what precautions or direction I should take about going to this appointment in that environment. Yeah, so the recommendation from the Ontario Medical Association just made yesterday is that non-essential appointments should be deferred at this time. Uh, and that's for all non-essential appointments. So I don't know about your hi health history. I don't know what's in your background. And it may be for some reason or another that the mammogram is actually essential in your case. So I, I can't speak to that specifically. But I can tell you that all non-essential appointments at this time are being deferred. Uh, in my office, I'm a family physician. I have, for example, called uh, patients who are having what's called a periodic health review. And I've, my staff has been telling them to put that off for about three months as a precaution right now. Let's move to Inga. Inga, you're live on the air. What's your question? I'm a 70-year-old senior. Um, I babysit my grandchildren. My daughter is a single mom with no other babysitter. My daughter is a registered nurse. The hospital where she works does have coronavirus patients. Um, what's your recommendation? Do I keep babysitting my grandchildren? Yeah, so this, first of all, thank you for the, 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 the babysitting that you've taken on to support the frontline healthcare workers because people like you are going to be critically important in, in allowing us to properly uh, fight this pandemic. Uh, you know, uh, so a couple of things here. One, you have to trust that uh, your daughter who's working in a healthcare facility, that they're applying and wearing proper personal protective equipment. So everyone who's now entering many healthcare facilities being screened before they come in with proper personal protective equipment. The hope is that uh, healthcare workers will not get sick within hospital settings. Uh, I, I'm not sure where you're living, whether the, the child care facility that your, that your grandchild is in has been closed, but many of them here in Ontario, the vast majority have been closed as of today. The announcement was made on Friday, at least in Toronto. So children who are remaining in the home and practicing social distancing, their risk is also hopefully going to be lower uh, because they're not interacting as much uh, in the community where transmission can occur. So if your daughter is a registered nurse and is practicing personal protective equipment, your child is somewhat socially distant, uh, you know, I, people need to have childcare plans and we need to be able to support your daughter doing the incredible frontline work that she's doing. So, uh, you know, under those circumstances, I think you can have some level of uh, assurance. We'll be back in a few minutes with more of your questions on COVID-19. You know, I would say that for the time being, it's probably best to keep your distance. I hate to say that when it's a grandchild involved. <laughs> Welcome back to our coverage of COVID-19. Today we're connecting with thousands of our members throughout the country to answer their questions on the coronavirus. So let's take the next call. We're moving on to Jim. Jim, you're live on the air. What is your question? My question is, if you have had COVID-19 and gone through it, 
and survive, do you have an immunity to it? Again, we're just, it's too early in the course of the illness to know that. We've heard some isolated reports of reinfections occurring coming out of the Far East, where of course the, the virus seems to have started. At this point in time, I don't think we can give you a proper answer to that. We, we just don't know yet, but I expect we'll know in the next couple of months. And so with that in mind, you know, once, if you have had COVID and you've recovered, you should be taking the same precautions as everyone else after your initial infection. Next, we have Maria on the line. Hi, Maria, what's your question? Um, I have a very compromised immune system. I'm 77. I have uh, chronic types of arthritis, RA being the primary one. In order to keep, and I'm very socially isolated, quite frankly, uh, with no family here. Um, my question is concerning what kinds of nutrition and um, uh, foods um, I stay hydrated um, should I be engaging in, and I can pass this on to some of my other colleagues who have um, diabetes and things of that nature. Yeah, so again, I would not be changing what you eat and drink at this time. Uh, the, keep hydrated, keep eating the food that you would normally eat. Uh, there's not, again, in other viral infections, for the overwhelming part, there's not a lot of good evidence that from nutritional sciences that eating specific types of food are going to boost your immunity. You may read those things, but we haven't had those recommendations from any of the health officials worldwide in the setting of this pandemic. So the key thing is just, you know, especially in your circumstance where you've You've highlighted you, you know, you have some challenges with the social network is just getting the access to food. That would be my bigger concern with you. And we're starting to see some wonderful things across the country with people reaching out to older adults to help them get the groceries. But in terms of your network and, and your sort of cohort of older adults who may have underlying diseases, just stay hydrated, keep eating the food you're normally eating and, and keep doing your normal routine. Okay, next on the line, we have Mary. Mary, you're live. What is your question? Well, originally I was going to ask about uh, looking after my grandchildren, but I'm going to nuance it a bit. Um, two of my grandchildren uh, have been at, are being at home. One is 10, and he's not going to go to any March break camps. The other is 2, and even though her daycare is still open in Burlington, my daughter decided to keep her home. I do have a grandson who attends private school, and it is still open. Do I need to avoid him, uh, which I don't want to do, but that's my question. Yeah, tough question. And it certainly highlights that there are still some challenges that we have in terms of getting the message out. Uh, at this point in time, the best recommendation that we can make is that social distancing is important. We're really glad the schools were closed down. Um, I don't know the number of people at your grandson's private school, and I don't know the situation there. Usually you're okay to come into contact with people who have not got symptoms, but again, that's evolving and we're learning more about asymptomatic spread as, the, as time comes along. So, you know, I would say that for the time being, it's probably best to keep your distance. I hate to say that when it's a grandchild involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get hundreds of questions like this a day, as I'm sure Dr. Gandhi does. Uh, there's no black and white answers here, right? It all relates to risk tolerance that you have. Uh, uh, as well as the necessity of childcare, which cannot be overlooked as well, right? All of these things are uh, a risk balance. I think the overwhelming message is as much social distancing as possible is better for everyone and particularly better for older adults, especially those with chronic conditions. So if, the more we can practice that, the better it is. Up next, we have Barbara on the line. Barbara, you're live. What's your question? Good afternoon. My question is regarding traveling to the UK. I live in Toronto, I'm 83, fit and very well, and I was tra I'm supposed to be traveling in April to England and staying until August. What do you suggest? Yeah, unfortunately right now the suggestions are not to travel. I appreciate that you are traveling for a long period of time, which means that you could potentially be at a point where things will have settled down with this circumstance but things are, are very, very unsteady right now. There are some questions, unfortunately, about the UK's response to how they're dealing with COVID-19. There are some stories about how they might be uh, not using isolation precautions and looking at herd immunity, which is a whole separate argument that we can get into. It'll probably take, an, probably take months, actually, to sort out. 
So we are recommending people no non-essential travel, and we are recommending that people stay at home. Okay, thank you for that question. Up next, we have Sharon on the line. Sharon, you're live on the air. What's your question? Hi. Yes, hi. With the concern of closures, what home care organizations can one call and um, where if one needs assistance, say, for some basic errands and at a reasonable cost, uh, if there is any? Yes, yeah, a hard question to answer. It depends not only on your province, but where you're living. Uh, and, you know, I can't speak to what all the individual home care organizations have done in terms of changing their practices. What I will say uh, in this sort of ever-evolving time is that I am reassuringly seeing a lot of goodwill on the part of Canadians. Um, there are a lot of, I'm not sure if you use the internet or online groups, but there are a lot of uh, just amazing community groups and people who have stepped up to try and help uh, older adults deal with things like grocery shopping or some of their basic needs, I would encourage you, and again, that's without cost, I would encourage you to try and pursue those things. And then you'd have to speak to your individual home care provider as to what they are and are not providing at this time. Yeah, and as far as I know, certainly from speaking to my own geriatric patients, home care is still providing services. And most home care agencies have a long list of resources that they can at least hook you up with. They may not provide those services directly, but they can at least hook you up with the resources. Okay, next on the line, we have Ken. Ken, you're live. What's your question, sir? Uh, question with regards to uh, do older people, are they more susceptible to contracting the disease than younger people? So older people aren't more susceptible to contracting the virus. Everyone can contract the, uh, the virus. That's sort of a common misconception. But older adults have a higher, uh, what we call morbidity, so comp like a more severe response to the virus, and they're also more likely to die when they do get the virus. And that's sort of what is being borne out in, in, in what we're reading in the media. So anyone can contract the virus, which is why we're advocating for widespread social distancing because even people who have milder symptoms can spread it to others. Older adults, again, uh, seem to be the ones at most risk of severe infection or death. Again, I spoke earlier that I don't think it's simply a result of age. Uh, when you age, you also accumulate underlying diseases. Some of the more older adults also tend to be institutionalized, so they're in places like nursing homes. Those types of places tend to be uh, institutions where risk of transmission can be higher because of people living in close quarters. So it's not just age alone, but certainly anyone can contract the virus. We need to take a short break. More on COVID-19 next. When you are an older adult and someone in your situation where you've had a previous history of cancer chemotherapy, people like you should be taking this extremely seriously. Welcome back to our special edition of The Zoomer on the coronavirus. We know that older adults are most vulnerable to the worst effects of the disease. For this reason, it is especially critical that we arm our audience with the most up-to-date information available. So we've opened our lines to take your questions. Next, we have Graham on the line. Graham, you're live. What's your question? Thank you for taking my question. I'm a member of a Rotary Club, and we're going to be celebrating our 70th anniversary on May the 13th. We started planning this uh, a few months ago before we heard of the virus, and uh, we have less than 250 people planning to attend. We hope to have somewhere around 100 to 150. However, we have many members who are over 65, and some of them have been snowbirds who have been down the south who plan to come back for this event. Our district governor has advised that it's up to each club to decide whether they continue with their meetings and their function. So I just thought I'd like to get a professional opinion, please. I feel like I'm someone who's giving a lot of bad news today, unfortunately. And the best recommendation I could make at this point in time is that you not hold the event. Uh, certainly, I've seen that happen throughout the province. The Ontario Medical Association, we've cancelled a number of our meetings and get-togethers. And of course, most of the staff that work for us are under the age of 65. And so I certainly, uh, I hate to tell you this, but my recommendation would be to not go ahead. All right, next on the line we have Linda. Linda, you're live on the air. What's your question? Morning, thank you for taking my call. I uh, had cancer 10 years ago and underwent extensive chemotherapy. I'm, and my immune system isn't what it used to be. 
and I'm wondering, uh, potentially, am I at a greater risk? Oh, I'm a 73-year-old senior. Yeah, so, I mean, these are all great questions, and, and, you know, one of the things that I'm hearing consistently here is that older adults are concerned, and we hear you, uh, and uh, we are trying our very best to sort of get the message out about what is accurate information, what's inaccurate information. So, yes, with increasing age, so let's put aside the previous cancer and chemotherapy history, increasing age, as I've highlighted, uh, not only is it the increasing age, we know that there is some impact, even if you didn't have this previous history, that when you age, you have a phenomenon called immunosenescence, where your immune system is simply not as strong as it is when you're younger. So that may play some role in it. Again, older adults tend to get more comorbidities, so underlying conditions like cancer, or they tend to be institutionalized, where that can lead to more spread. So when you, when you are an older adult and someone in your situation where you've had a previous history of cancer chemotherapy, People like you should be taking this extremely seriously uh, in terms of the practices we talked about, so careful hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, uh, not or avoiding others who may be sick. But I think what this also speaks to is a larger issue where a lot of older adults are very fearful right now, um, and, and appropriately so, but we all need to be thinking about people like you in terms of changing our own behaviors because we know that younger individuals seem to be mostly spared the, the worst consequences of this. And I would caution that that is just data current as of today. And we're seeing reports from other jurisdictions where young people are getting serious infections. But we need to think about people like you when we're trying to motivate society to change their behavior on a wide scale right now. Next, we have Nick on the line. Nick, you're live. What's your question? Uh, I have a prescription from my doctor for Prevnar 13, which I haven't filled yet. Should I, or is it advisable, that I should take this injection at this point? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, the immunization has been tested. It's good for you. It reduces your risk of getting multiple infections. Uh, it is an important, important infection to prevent. Uh, it is not related in any way to COVID-19, but it's just good health care, and you're looking after yourself and taking care of your body by getting the injection. And one of the things related to COVID is that we've seen data, again, this is really emerging data, but a lot of people who are dying from COVID are not necessarily dying from the virus itself. They're dying from other complications, cardiovascular complications or secondary bacterial infections. So one gets a, another bug in the setting of having COVID where your immune system gets suppressed and then can die from that. So it's really critical to take care of your baseline level of health, not to change the medications that you're normally taking, not to change the important preventative stuff outside of the sort of non-elective, uh, sorry, outside of the elective non-urgent things that Dr. Gandhi talked about earlier, because that's going to set you up best if you should get infected with the virus. All right, moving along, we have Lynn on the line. Lynn, you're live on the air. What's your question? Um, my question is, I saw uh, a piece on television about the containment area in New Rochelle, and they had large signs that said, keep your windows closed. And I'm just wondering, do you agree with that? Are we supposed to be keeping our windows closed? Is it okay to go out for a walk and get some fresh air? Yeah, so What's your response? Social distancing refers to close contact with other people and it refers to making sure that you don't go into crowded environments. I think that it's really important to recognize that that does not mean you're going to sit at home and watch TV all day because all that will happen is your health is going to deteriorate just by doing that. Yes, I do think you should go outside and, and go for a walk, particularly if you're fortunate enough to be in, in areas that aren't, uh, aren't very crowded. I think it's okay for you to exercise regularly. I think you should do all the preventative stuff that we've talked about before. Uh, I'm not familiar with uh, this keep your windows closed. That's certainly the first I'm hearing about it. It's more droplet context, so on this wouldn't seem to make much sense to me. Uh, but yes, go for a walk, get some fresh air, particularly the past couple of days have been nice and sunny. It's good for your soul. Um, get some exercise. Okay, Jane's next. Jane, you're live on the air. What's your question? Yes, um, my question is, is it safe to eat um, food from the grocery store, which is not wrapped? as in uh, fruit that you don't peel, like grapes, or olives or something from the antipasta bar? 
So these are all good questions. Uh, you know, we, I, it's, I can't give you a precise scientific opinion on all these things, but for many of the things, you, for the overwhelming sort of majority of these things, yes, it is safe based upon the recommendations of our public health officials. But take the precautions one would normally take. If you're eating grapes, most of us will wash the grapes before they eat them. Uh, you know, things like shared, you, you've highlighted the olive bar, so things like shared uh, sort of uh, serving areas, I'm seeing a lot of places shutting those down, probably appropriately so. That would be an area where you know, there's probably a little more of a heightened level of concern. Again, what we're dealing with is a virus where you sneeze or cough out the droplets. They sit on a surface, and then it requires you to, to get those on some part of your, your body and, and introduce those into your mucous membranes. So you know, the risk in terms of an individual piece of food is very, very small. But I, I would have more concern about the shared sort of serving areas as opposed to non sort of, or as opposed to foods that are unwrapped or th things that are, don't have a peel on them. All right, we'll be right back after this short break. At best, we're months away from a vaccination. I'm not confident that a vaccination is going to uh, be in play here to deal with this current pandemic that we're experiencing. Welcome back to our special CARP and Zoomer Media Coronavirus Information Town Hall. Let's get back to the lines. We have Courtney on the line. Courtney, you're live. What is your question? Uh, my question is, I am 80 years old, arthritis, um, high blood pressure, and NEP CA. I am due for my Pneumovax and my flu vaccine, and I want to know if it's safe to take those, because five days ago I was in an eMERGE setting, there are a few people with coughs and masks, and I'm wondering what the risk is with that, if this is droplet or close contact. Yeah, so again, a great question. I would say that if you don't yourself currently have any symptoms of a fever, a cough, runny nose, muscle aches, then it is safe. And again, this is preventative stuff like we talked about before. This is really, really important. As we'd heard before, uh, COVID unfortunately sometimes causes uh, complications because you get sick from it, but then you get a secondary infection. So getting all your vaccines up to date, including particularly the Pneumovax and the Prevnar, as the other caller had mentioned, really, really important to do. Okay, we've got Claire next on the line. Claire. You're live on the air. What's your question? Oh, yes, it's uh, so. Sh should we expect that this kind of process is likely to be repeated with other viruses? You know, from from what we understand, there is sort of globally expected to be an increase in the rates of pandemics for a number of reasons uh, that have to do with climate change, how we interact with animals. Uh, so these things are expected to increase. Uh, but in terms of when we should expect something like this, uh, I think most of us are focused right now on what we're dealing with on hand. And I would just like to add that you know, one of the things that this highlights is that unfortunately right now on social media, there's a lot of misinformation about this particular virus. And so what I would encourage everyone who's listening to do is to get your information from an appropriate source. Uh, if you want, you can go to virusfacts.ca. That's a website that's been set up by the Ontario Medical Association that represents your doctor. So it's from your doctor. It's meant for your patients. And you can get all the facts that you need about this virus there. Because unfortunately, there, there is quite a bit of misinformation as we're seeing. OK, Ramona's next. Ramona, you're live on the air. What is your question? I understand that vitamin C is very helpful in boosting your immune system, and there have actually been reports from China saying that they have fought the virus by introducing massive doses of uh, vitamin C into a person's system. Now, um, if you look at the internet, um, it's saying that this is nonsense. Uh, I'm wondering what the doctors there think. Uh, so, yes, you'll be able to find a report for most things in this pandemic suggesting that X, Y, or Z may be helpful. But from what we know at this point, uh, there doesn't seem to be 
evidence to widely support that, and there's nothing that's, there are, people are not administering high dose of vitamin C uh, widely. I do think, though, when we're in a, a situation like this, we actually can't discount anything as a possibility. Uh, there may be experimental or compassionate treatments, uh, particularly as people are much more sick, uh, and, and we're dealing with them in the sort of more critical stages of the illness. But again, in terms of your day-to-day -day life, I would practice the things that you were doing for your preventative health before this all started. Uh, you know, vitamin C was studied uh, uh, famously by Linus Pauling, actually, to, uh, for prevention of the common cold. There's actually no evidence that that works. Um, so whether that could be extrapolated to coronavirus, we don't know. But uh, one could ask the same question for a whole host of other supplements in, uh, in the setting. Okay, next on the line, we have Tony. Tony, you're live on the air. What's your question? Uh, my, my question is, everything is a case of risk-benefit management. And at the present time, being an older gentleman who recently lost his wife, uh, I'm beginning to worry about social isolation, that uh, you can't seem to make a connection with uh, with people anymore. You, you, you start uh, mistrusting people, everyone you meet. Uh, you worry about whether or not they might give you the disease or not. So my concern is, how far do we go with this social isolation? That's an excellent question. And first of all, I'm very sorry for the loss of your wife. Uh, I know that must have been very difficult for you to go through something like that. Uh, I have to tell you that I work in a nursing home myself. That's one of the parts of my practice. And it is remarkable to me just how much the residents of the nursing home, how they light up when family comes to visit, uh, when they get their friends in to visit them. You know, you can see this light bulb go on and they smile and they're just different people when people visit. So I certainly hear your concerns about social isolation. And we need to figure out, use our technology that we have through things like FaceTime, video conferencing, something to ensure that there's still some social contact that's going on. I, I'm very hopeful that this period of social distancing that we're undergoing right now will be time limited and will be fairly short, a uh, couple of months, hopefully. I, we don't know for sure. But if we can just get through this, then I agree with you. Social isolation is something that's, that's absolutely critical to deal with. Okay, we have time left for just a few more questions. Next on the line is Bev. Bev, you're live on the air. What's your question? I have two questions. Um, I'm, these are pre probably further on in the course of things, but um, any idea of how soon or how close we are to a vaccination for this? And the second question is that I'm aware that multi-system shutdown is um, often um, involved in the cause of death. And um, are there any medications or any uh, interventions that we are coming up with um, to circumvent that? Yeah, so uh, at best, we're months away from a vaccination. Um, so I I'm, I'm not confident that a vaccination is going to uh, be in play here to deal with this current pandemic that we're experiencing. Uh, but science is remarkable at some, you know, sometimes, and sometimes we're surprised. But from what we're hearing from, a, from scientists and colleagues around the world, it's not something we should be expecting as we're planning right now. Your second question, speaking to sort of, and I think you're speaking about a phenomenon known as sepsis and, and shock, uh, where multiple organs can shut down in the face of an overwhelming infection. Again, uh, the best w things that you can do right now are to keep up with your primary health care, the medications that you normally take, adequately treating your blood pressure, getting your vaccinations. Uh, those are the things that when someone is critically ill, you need to have the reserve to be able to fight an infection like this. And keeping up with your primary health care, the things that your family physician tells you to do or your primary health care practitioner is absolutely essential. We'll head over to a live question from Ivan. Ivan, what's your question? Could you give me the exact definition of self-isolation? Does that still include being able to go to get uh, groceries? So the definition seems to evolve, but the, the concept of self-isolation is that you should avoid crowded uh, places. You should try to stay at home or in your yard. Um, you can go to things like grocery shopping, pharmacies, I and mean, you have to go get your medicine, urgent medical appointments, but you should reduce things that aren't absolutely essential. So if there's a party that's happening, you should probably avoid going to the party. Uh, but 
you know, if you have to go to a doctor's appointment for an urgent medical condition, of course you should go to that. We need to take a short break. More on COVID-19 when we come back. <laughs> Don't forget, for free tickets to the show, go to www.universe.com and search Zoomer Media and log on to www.thezoomertv.com for full episodes and more. Welcome back to our special edition of the Zoomer on the coronavirus. With a few minutes remaining, are there a few thoughts and closing remarks that you'd like to share with our viewers? Yeah, so I think it's simply recapping what we talked about before. Really important to avoid uh, activities that aren't essential. Really important to wash your hands regularly, don't touch your eyes, nose and mouth. And I just, I really need to stress the fact that with so much information that's out there, to a comment that I made earlier, there's some misinformation out there. In fact, unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation online, particularly through social media. So virusfacts.ca is an excellent website that has all of the information that you need to protect yourself. Uh, it is run by your doctor. Please go to an approved site to get the information that you need. Mm -hmm. and Dr. Stahl. Yeah, this is a really challenging time for everyone in our society. Um, we have to have, I think, faith in, in, in the goodwill of other Canadians that people are going to practice social distancing to, pra to pr you know, prevent the infection for those who are most vulnerable, many of the callers and participants in this, uh, in this event today. Uh, but I think we also have to, to re recognize for those who are le less vulnerable to the catastrophic effects of the virus and less vulnerable to being sort of... Uh, you know, uh, having the negative consequences of social distancing, we need to reach out to our neighbors and people around us, particularly older adults, to find out how we can be of assistance during this time, to just ask them how they're doing. Um, because, you know, and not only the goods that we consume, but just checking in for psychological well-being. We know that this is going to be a difficult time. We hear you, particularly the older adults uh, in our society. We know this is an extremely stressful time for you. And so I cannot urge Canadians enough uh, to change their behavior and the, what they're doing for the good of everyone, but also to remember to be humane and to be Canadian. And for those that do have travel plans within the next month, within the next three months, six months, what do you suggest? That we're no. black and white on. I yeah. mean, the government has said do not do not avoid all non-essential travel. I mean, there are going to be circumstances where something is essential, but any non-essential travel should be avoided until the government tells us otherwise. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. That's all the time we have. Thank you to Dr. Nathan Stahl and Dr. Sohail Gandhi for your expertise and advice. To our audience, if you have any additional questions on COVID-19, please email us at advocacy at Thank you for joining us.